Okay, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back. So we are going to continue reading through the Sefer Yemei Shmuel, which we've been reading here on my YouTube channel. We said we were going to read the, the 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 whole entire Sefer, so we are going to read the whole entire Sefer. We are up to Paraklavid, and uh, it starts getting a little bit more interesting now. Before we were talking about more of the, the hardships of Tzvat, now we're going to start talking about uh, more about his life, how he started meeting Breslovers. It starts getting a little bit more uh, eventful. But this first chapter that we're going to read today, Paraklamet still is talking about some of these things about Tzvat, how hard it was back then. So he says that after Pesach, we finish off the last chapter, it was Pesach. He said after Pesach, there was a very, very big storm on a Friday. My father was caught in the storm. And uh, he got very, very sick from this. And he got typhus again. And at the time that my father was sick, there was another story that happened with Rav Chaim Sitoin Zal, who we mentioned before in different chapters. He was a big tzaddik who lived in Tzvat. And he was also very sick. And he lived alone. And only his little granddaughter, who was a very, very small little girl, um, lived with him, I guess, to watch him or whatever. Because his wife and the rest of his family went out of Eretz Yisrael. And one day, she left the house, this little girl, and he left, and he, you know, and he was left alone. And he went out to the courtyard uh, by himself, and I guess since he was sick and he couldn't see her or whatever, he fell into a bar shaman. He fell into a pit full of water. And when the little girl couldn't find him, she came back, she couldn't find him. Uh, she found that his shoes were next to this bar. She went outside, she started screaming, and people came. And the whole entire city came, and they bought ladders, and they put, and they took him out of this bar. And he still had a little bit of of, um, of life left in him, a vow, but they couldn't revive him, and he died. And it was great tsar and sadness over the whole entire city, because um, he was a very, very big tzaddik, and a great Talmud Chacham, and giving halachic psak and everything like that. And it was mamish like Tisha B'av in the whole entire city. Um, we made a big funeral. Uh, they didn't want to tell his father. They didn't want to tell Rosh Mahar what's his father because he was because he was his he was his good friend. Uh, because he and he was also sick, so they didn't want to tell him. But then, when he saw outside through the window the big funeral passing by into the into the basic forest into the cemetery, so then we had to tell him. And he says, "This last year, also had typhus shamois I think this typhus was very bad in the city. Um, killed, he says, at least one tenth of the city or something like that." Whole families were dying, and also Doctor Green also got. He was he was he was one of the Jewish doctors in the city. He also uh, sorry, just check my phone, see if there's a rock alert. Um, uh, he also was sick, and this Doctor Green came with Professor Friedlander, who was a very very good man. They came before the war from America to Israel to fix people's eyes to medically treat people who had eye problems. And this Professor Friedlander did a lot of surgeries on people, everything free, and Dr. Green would help them afterwards. And uh, they worked in the hospital there and everything like that. Anyway, and the story goes that this Professor Freelander made an announcement that you know, everybody wants to fix their eyes could, you know, come and fix their eyes, you know, whatever, whoever had problems with their eyes could come get treated. And a lot of people came, but the people in the hospital started taking money without him knowing, and he was very angry about it because he said that he came from America to, you know, do, a, do this for free. Afterward, this professor left Tzvas, and Dr. Green stayed in Tzvas, and he became the doctor of Tzvas, um, and he then his wife gave birth and he got sick and he gave a lot of tzedakah and he died and the whole entire city only had one doctor an Arab doctor 
he, there was another doctor named Dr. Kaufman. He also was sick. So we see that there was a lot of problems in uh, Tzvat back then with typhus and everything like that. Now he talks about meeting Rabbi Yisrael Kardun, or how we call him Rabbi Yisrael Karduner. He was also a very, very big wrestler. So he says, and then also I started knowing Rabbi Yisrael Bnei Kardun, who was from the Chasidei Breslov. Remember at this point in the story, Rosh Horowitz was not really a Breslover yet. Um, he says that Rabbi, Rabbi Yisrael Karduner was his neighbor. And I saw that he had a very, very holy appearance. Even though I didn't know anything about Chasidus Breslov. And then Rabbi Yisrael Kardun moved to the city of Tiberia. To the city of Tiberia with his wife and their two children. He had a son and a daughter. Um, I saw them moving and, they, and, and I saw that there was Sifrei Rabbi Nachman with them and everything like that. And all the kids in the spot used to look at them. Um, when they were walking around or whatever, and there was kids who used to say that you can't, that they would say to his kids that you can't look in these farm. They were referring to this farm of Rabbi Nachman. And Rabbi Yisrael's wife would argue with them, why is it also to look at them? And I didn't know anything, Rosh Hashanah says. All I knew is that they had very, very holy appearances. And, and and people who would go to Rabbi Yisrael were very very you know simple people, and and you know good people. Because he says that the smart people, the chachamim, and anybody else who was you know whatever, were would would were very embarrassed to even try to go close to him, you know, because they didn't want to be known as wrestlers. Like we said. But their faces and their tsuros, their appearance was very very, had was full of light, was full of holy light. And they used to serve Hashem greatly. They used to get up for chatzois. And they would say Tehillim. Um, and like Rabbi Nachman taught in the Sefer of Sipuri Maisius, the story of the Ben Melech and the Ben Shifchash and the Schalfu, and the story called the Exchanged Children, where the son of the king and the son of a, of a servant gets switched at birth. And at the end of the story, I mean, Nachman talks about that there's a certain kli, that if you put this kli on a certain animal, on any animal, it will start singing. It will start singing a beautiful nigan. And this is what it's saying, like, basically, like, when you become close to Rabbi Nachman, you start singing a beautiful nigan. Um, even a simple person who starts serving Hashem through the teachings of Rabbi Nachman, you can already see that he's going to start singing a beautiful nigan. He's already going to start having a beautiful aura. He's going to start, he's already start having a beautiful light, the light of Rabbi Nachman. And he's going to feel chiyas and tainu, and pleasure, which is impossible to say over. Um, so he, this is a little bit of an introduction of how you know, Rav Shmuel Horowitz started meeting you know, wrestlers and things like that. It doesn't really say over here that he met him, but he, he he understood them. And before this, there was a story, he says that there was one woman in Tzfat who used to sell butter, and she would, she would, she would wrap the butter in the pages of the Sefer Shifche Aran, which was printed in Yiddish. Because if I took this Sefer from her with money, and even though I didn't know that that it was from Rabbi Nachman, I didn't want it to be used, I guess, for butter. <laughs> so that is cool. Okay, now it gets back a little bit of history. So let's see. So he says, my father, remember we said that he went to Syria. Um... And he told me, Rosh Hashanah was saying that his father told him that uh, when he came back from Chalev, there was a very, very big city there. And it was very, very strong. There was all types of soldiers. German soldiers, Austrian soldiers, Turkish soldiers. More more soldiers there than the whole entire Eretzrael and, and, and stuff like that. Um... There was a lot of people there also who were expelled from Yishalayim. 
Um, people were running away from getting taken into the army and things like that. There was also one person there, one Avrech, a young man there from Yushalayim, that they took into this in, that they that they that they took into the army, and they bought him, and they and they and, you know and they bought him to there, and he ran away, and he was hiding in the shul. But he didn't really. Then he still. But he he didn't really care. So he just would go in the streets or whatever. And when he heard that the Memshelis Anglia that England had captured Yushalayim, he decided, "Let me go back to Yushalayim and see what I can do." So he started going to Yushalayim. He he met. Remember, in those days, you could just cross borders, I don't know, whatever, I'm saying Syria, Israel, whatever, all these things, Lebanon. He met, on the way to Yushalayim, he met German soldiers, who, their head of the soldiers, their Mifake, their commander, was a Jew. Um, and he asked this commander, take me in, into your army as a Jew, you know, as a soldier, because you're going to Yushalayim anyway. So he did that. And they put on, you know, army clothes on him, uniform. You know, with them. And then, but then they were walking, and, a, and then a and then a higher ranking commander came, and he counted the chalim, and he found that there was one extra. So, they thought that he was a spy. So they sent him back to Chalev, um, with different officers, and they, you know, they watched him the whole entire time. Uh, they to to bring him to get sentenced sentenced to death because he was a spy. Da, 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 da. And they already knew in the city of Chal that this was going to happen. And in a few more days, they would have to hang someone. Uh, and all the Jews who were there already prepared a lot of kesef on this that they could maybe you know find. Uh, they could try to bribe them. So instead of killing him, they would just put him in jail for the rest of his life. And then, anyway, the next day they came to the shul and they found this guy in the shul who was supposed to be sentenced to death. And he said, how did you, how did you survive? What's the story? So he says that when they were already bringing him on the train, and they were already getting to the city of Chalev, he fell asleep. And he saw his grandfather from the Oilam al from heaven, came to him in a dream. And he said to him, what are you doing? Run away. So he woke up. He was very scared, obviously, to do this. But he saw that all the police officers were sleeping. Uh, maybe he thought that they were like fake sleeping. Maybe they would wake up if he did. Even if they really were sleeping, maybe they would wake up. But he said, you know what? Let me try. The, and whatever will be, will be. And he took off his jacket or whatever, or his Beget Elio in the first you know layer of clothing that he was wearing, he put it on the bench. And he opened the door of their wagon and he actually closed it with a very, very big like he tried to make as much noise as possible. Cause that if they wake up, so then they would say, Okay, fine, he's just going to the bathroom and he left his, you know, Beget Elio in there or whatever. But he saw that, that a great sleep had fallen upon them and they weren't waking up. It was like something from Hashem. So he decided to jump um, and he jumped off the train until he came to the city and he came back to even he came back to the same city until he came to the shul and they dressed him differently and they were very happy. And, my fa- and what's the whole point of the story? Is my father's telling me Rosh Hashanah's story. He says, my, what, and what my father wondered so much about the story That 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 the next day they needed to buy he needed to buy something he went out by himself they thought okay fine maybe after he was already caught he's going to be a little bit more careful but no he decided he's going to go outside who Omar he said why am I doing this he says that when he sees a katsin when he sees somebody high up from the army that wants to take him right 
or from someone from the government, and he's scared that, he's, that they shouldn't ask him for his passport. So he would just go close to them, mamish, and he would ask, and he would ask for a cigarette from them, or he would ask what time it is. Right, basically he's saying, he, like, he would go close to them and he'd be like, of course this guy's not going to be trying something stupid. He's just, for sure, has a passport because why would he be walking close to us, right? If you're trying to avoid them, we're going to ask questions, but he's not trying to avoid them. So that was, like, his little trick. And then he stayed, and this guy was able to stay in, um, he was able to stay in Khalev until... The city of uh, until Tsarfat took over the city, and then he went back to Yishalayim. What is the city of Chalav? Let's look at my phone for one second over here. I know what the city of Chalav is. I've heard of it. I just want to see what the name of it is today. Aleppo. I should have known that. The city of Aleppo in Syria. So that is what Chalav is called. It's called Aleppo. I don't know why it's called that in the Is it that? Let me see what it is. Yeah, Alep. Okay. That's what it is. How much do we do today? I asked you like 10 more minutes. Why not? Then Rosh Maharwitz continues. He said there were some times that the Sar Jamal Pasha Hagadol, who was, I guess, one of the Turkish leaders, a great leader, he visited us in Tzvas. When he came, the fear and the pachad was 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 impossible to even explain. Even small children in their cribs were shaking from fear. Even from his name. Because even some of his closest friends that who thought they were close to him, he, he had killed in the past. Um, and also at one point time they they also he hung three Arabs in Sfat in the middle of the main street and left them there the whole entire day. And he killed many of the Ar- uh, from many of the Armenians, killed millions of them. He burned them. Basically, he was a he was not a good person. This Jamal Pasha was a very very scary person. And so he says that Haklal. To, 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 to say stories about the Jamal Pasha would, you know, be a waste of time. Not, not a waste of time, but it would take up so much time because there's so many stories. And obviously, all the, and all the preparation that they made when he would come, the Chola ear, everybody would come from, the, from all the Talmud Chayras, all the Jews, from the base classes, everybody, everybody had to go out and meet him when he came to the city with special songs. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the Rabbanim used to have to go out with the Sefer Torahs. Um, and, 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 and sometimes they would go because they heard he was coming and they had to wait outside the whole entire day of the city. He never came. So it was already you know, a waste of a day. But that was life back then. And one time he had to come on Shabbos. Everybody had to go out on Shabbos because there was no choice. Um, and, the, and, and, and they also wanted to have musicians, people to play music, sorry, musicians to play music on Shabbos. And this musician was a Jewish person who was a year of Shemayim. Obviously, he didn't want to break Shabbos. He didn't want to be Mechal Shabbos. Okay, and Hechbi is Atzim, Bechoyim Shabbos, the basic chorus. He hid himself a whole entire day in the basic chorus. And the Memshala, the government, searched for him all day so that he could play songs. Avalai Matsu Asai. Bechoshu Shabeshvil Zah Yia Achaz Dosai Lahamis. I don't know what that means. They didn't want to kill him when they did find him. I'm not sure. But Hashem is Baruch Azur Loi B'Schush Loi Ratzachal Shabbos Shagam Pasha Loi Bal Tzvas by Shabbos. That Hashem held that the Jamal Pasha did not end up coming to that to to Tzvan on that Shabbos, even though they waited from the whole entire day, and they didn't do anything to this musician that was hiding the whole entire Shabbos because he didn't want to break Shabbos. And Rav Shmuel Harowitz says that I also remember when I was a small child, that one time. The Chacham Bashi from Istanbul came, Rabbi Chaim Nachum, and the whole entire city went out to greet him. Even more than when they would go out to obviously meet the Jamal Pasha, who was an evil man. 
and my father carried me on his shoulders, and I was and I and I was able to see the uh, Chachabashi. And it was just, it, he was just saying that it was just a great celebration and everything like that. All right, let's see what's going on over here. All right, I think that's where we're going to end today over here. Because this is where we're going to end. But next week, we will do more.